Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Everybody, you're very welcome to a new episode of Redefining Cybersecurity here on ITSP Magazine. And uh, as you know, li listening to my show, that uh, I'm all about taking technology and operationalizing it in a way that helps the business grow and protects that growth as uh, as we move along. And of course, uh, AI is a is a hot topic <laughs> for for a lot of ways to generate growth. Um, which is rooted in data, of course, and using data to drive business isn't new, but I think some of the ways that AI is being uh, leveraged, certainly generative AI, uh, taps into a lot of public data and potentially even some business data that maybe in the future we might go or say, I wish we hadn't done it, at least not like that. And uh, this conversation today, I'm thrilled to have Rob Vanderveer. Rob, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Sean, for inviting me. Uh, it's going to be a fun conversation, and it's spawned or in, in the spirit of a post that you wrote. And uh, it starts off with sometimes the things we do with technology are like smoking on an airplane. It seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> and uh, you, you reference a few few scenarios from the past in this post that uh, you can look at them and say, yeah, I can see where that seemed like a good idea. We, we did some good things for society. We took bad people off the streets and, and all the other stuff that you put in there and others that we'll probably touch on today. Um, but then hindsight's 2020. When we look back, we might say that we should have done it differently perhaps. So I'm excited to get into that conversation with you. Before we do though, Rob, a few words about uh, yourself, some of the things you've done in the industry, some of the work you've done, and uh, then we'll get into why that post. Absolutely. So I'm, uh, you could say, an AI veteran in the industry since 1992, after I finished uh, uh, my computer science education, specializing in AI. I was a programmer as a data scientist, and we, we built AI models for everything. And our clients didn't want to hear it was artificial intelligence. They found that to be quite scary. So we called it data mining, like everybody in the field uh, in, the, in that day, or pattern recognition. I was a researcher, a data scientist, a hacker, a CTO, and also ran uh, AI companies as a CEO for about uh, nine years. And after being in you know, the software product industry uh, for long, I joined uh, Software Improvement Group 12 years ago and made the move from making programs to uh, analyzing programs uh, and helping our clients to build better software because in my career I had made so many mistakes that I wanted uh, other uh, organizations uh, uh, yeah, some help, uh, offer, offer them some help to prevent those mistakes. And we help clients with building maintainable software, good architecture, secure, privacy preserving. And in that period, I set up practices for security and privacy and for artificial intelligence, because increasingly we, we had clients uh, yeah, that were building AI systems and they needed help. And uh, we started developing our own platform. Um, and after 12 years now, we are mainly uh, a software vendor because we provide a platform with additional uh, you know, um, advisory services. So I'm back in the in the software industry. And uh, I do innovation projects for SIG, uh, client projects all around the world. Um, I try to make a difference by doing some what we call thought leadership, sharing insights and expertise from our own research and our observations. And we do this through publications and taking part in standardization. Uh, we do this for the European AI Act for ISO. So I was uh, the lead author of uh, ISO IEC 5338 on AI life cycle, which has just been released. 
Uh, we contribute to uh, OWASP projects like SAM, which is a secure software development framework. We do research for ENISA. Um, I'm also in ISO 27090 in the working group for AI security, uh, the 91 for AI uh, privacy. Uh, and I'll lead two OWASP projects. One is OpenCRE, which is a catalog integrating all security standards and the AI exchange, uh, which is basically open sourcing the AI security discussion. And especially these days when everything is about AI, uh, there's never a dull moment. So this is probably the most busy period of my uh, career. And uh, I, I try to stay healthy. That's, that's a challenge, uh, <laughs> but I'm loving every moment of it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I mean so, so much, uh, so much work there. And what strikes me are just the the sheer number of things that you're involved with, uh, either contributing to or leading. And I'm I'm thinking about that list, and there there are more. I think there's another another ISO. I think both of those touch AI to some degree. Anyway, my point is yeah. a huge list of guides, frameworks, standards, certainly regulations. And as a, as a business, how does one begin to even <laughs> tackle understanding what those are? Um, as they're also trying to tackle, well, what does AI mean for our business? What data do we have? What data can we get access to? What systems can we build? What applications should we build? What open source should we leverage to create something cool that drives value and creates growth? That, that's a big effort all on its, unto itself. And then you add the security and privacy stuff that you just listed. It can get yeah. pretty overwhelming. So any thoughts on, on that as we get started? Yeah, I agree. It's overwhelming. And what is good is that um, uh, governments are you know starting with setting boundaries uh just you know to prevent things getting getting out of hand like in the us and like uh, in, the, in in europe with the uh, ai act and there's a lot of activity in trying to make things more simple like for example the owasp llm top 10 uh, the work from bsi from enisa from nist from mitre from etsy everybody's doing the best uh to try to make things simple and create frameworks. At the same time, it is impossible uh, for all these initiatives to try to stay aligned because uh, you just can't do that. So there's the pressure of the pace of the industry currently, and there's the proliferation of the frameworks and the terminology. So this alignment problem is now an issue because despite all these great intent, um, thing is that uh, there is uh, uh, there are discrepancies between these frameworks, which makes it harder for people to uh, to deal with this. And we've seen this with security standards as well, uh, which is what we're trying to solve with OpenCRE by creating a catalog of common requirements and linking from every common requirement to how it is being covered in the various standards. And we're working on doing the same thing for uh, for AI, try to align those things and the initiative i mentioned the ai exchange is also open sourcing that discussion because we saw that from doing the work for the for the european ai act you need a large set of experts multidisciplinary to deal with this complex fast moving topic and you you can't have all those in one specific committee for a sense analytic you need to uh, use the wisdom of the crowd uh, in order to get the best overview, which is why we set up the AI exchange and why we made it completely copyright free. So every uh, standard maker out there, every framework maker can you know, eavesdrop into the AI exchange, which is a very comprehensive overview of all the AI security threats and, and controls and make use of it. They don't have to attribute us. It's free for everybody to use because we believe that only through this sort of altruistic approach and, and sharing all those insights from experts around the world who can join in on this open source, we can create the alignment that will eventually help to make things more simple for every organization. Nice one. We'll have to, uh, have to take a look at that AI exchange, perhaps even have a deeper, deeper chat on that uh, in, in a separate episode. You I can find it, to... way, I'm sorry to interrupt, Sean. Yep. I forgot to no, mention that, that you can find it at owaspai.org. 
Auric. Very good. Very good. I want to go to the article because I I think for me it made me made me pause and think, and I suspect it's going to make uh, the audience uh, listening and watching do the same. And what was the catalyst for writing that piece? What prompted you to do that? It was a short piece, uh, like I often do on LinkedIn, share some insights that I hope help people. Uh, so in my work, I get the question a lot, uh, will AI regulation stifle innovation? And there are two ways that this is taking place. Uh, the first one is you need to do some administration uh, uh, regarding your risks and look into them and do some assessment uh, with regards to security and with regards to responsible AI, just to make sure that your AI system is not doing any harm. I think this is a good idea. And recent research has shown that um, this is a relatively small effort that is um, also beneficial to the business itself because it not only makes you comply with regulation, it only prevents you uh, for having incidents that will eventually harm your business. So that's the sort of uh, doing your homework, doing your risk analysis efforts that is required uh, and beneficial for uh, the organization. The other way that regulations can stifle innovation is by simply saying what you're doing, you can't do that because it's simply too high risk. Uh, and the European AI Act identifies a number of applications uh, that are will not uh, be allowed anymore. Uh, like, for example, uh, large-scale biometrics, like, for example, uh, face recognition uh, in, uh, in public space, and uh, criminal profiling in the sense of using uh, properties of persons, of individuals, uh, as input to uh, predicting their uh, behavior and then acting on it uh, from within the police. And uh, so my answer to when I get this question would al always be, well, yeah, it will stifle some innovation and prevent some innovation because we now, by now, believe as a society, or well, at least in Europe, uh, that certain things are wrong. Um, but they didn't used to be wrong. And you always see that with technology. Technology comes, people start applying it for everything, and then suddenly there's a realization, whoops, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but maybe we should do that a little bit less. That was the thought that I wanted to put in that piece. And I was also referring to, um, well, basically data analysis, business intelligence, IT in general, allowing us to connect all those databases. And we first had the idea, wow, data is the new oil. But we came back from that idea a little bit because we saw uh, the harm and the potential harm that it could do to individuals when their personal data would leak, for example. Uh, and, well, uh, harm their, uh, their, uh, their human rights, basically, their fundamental rights. And we came up with privacy regulation to uh, protect people. And in the same way, we're now coming up with AI regulation to uh, act on our realizations of things that we shouldn't be doing. And I mentioned one particular uh, example of my own, uh, which is helping the police back in the 90s to uh, reduce crime by giving, uh, for example, juvenile delinquents uh, uh, attention depending on their profile. So based on their age and the type of things that, the, that they uh, have been doing, giving them proper attention and assessing uh, their level of, for example, uh, repeated offense. And this was at the time carefully analyzed uh, by privacy officers, by lawyers, uh, everybody involved said, well, this is a good balance between uh, safety of our society and the rights of the individual, which in this case, uh, the delinquent. Now, uh, that was then. Now we would, we, we would not do that anymore. Uh, so this is what I shared in the article. And it got some great positive responses, but also some quite negative responses. So that was interesting, yeah. Yeah, it seems, uh, it seems the binary is growing, 
growing stronger and, and more polarized on, on a number of things, of course. Um, I'm, I'm curious, to, let's, let's spend a little time on this because I believe, I guess what I'm, what I want to question is that there's the, I think you said you wouldn't do that now. And I'm wondering, is it, is it because of new regulations that that wouldn't happen anymore? That the, those, those procedures wouldn't be viable or ethical or, or is it a matter of, we just don't think society will, will allow it. Um, because I know it, I don't know, it was probably 10 years ago. We did, uh, we did a podcast, uh, looking at a rideshare company that collected tons of data and, and there were laws that in California that prevented them from storing that data and sharing it with the exception of, uh, I think counties in California that, that had an agreement with them. So I guess my point is mm -hmm. government entities can kind of be exempt from some of these laws. So why, why would, why would we not do that? Is it a societal thing? Is it a legal thing? Uh, what, what's the catalyst there? It's so you could say that, um, specific values and ethical principles are static throughout time. But when you draw the, the balance with ethical dilemmas, in this case, the rights of the individual versus uh, safety, uh, safety in society, this can change over time. Um, so it's actually uh, the, the, the values that we have today with regards to, for example, uh, uh, protecting um, uh, equal treatment, allowing people to get equally treated, uh, independent of their ethnicity. Let me give you a very specific example. So back in the day, we used uh, frequency uh, of offense as input to our model to predict whether people would you know, offend again uh, as a repeat offender. And the po police used that. Now, um, that model didn't use et ethnicity at all as, as an input. But it turns out uh, that um, certain ethnicities uh, have a habit uh, through all kinds of societal uh, and neighborhood reasons of um, doing more frequent offenses. And this caused that our model back then had a bias towards ethnicity through this proxy, which is frequency. Back in the day, we said, okay, we have some bias, but it's indirect. Uh, and we believe that if we don't do anything, we cannot give the right attention uh, to, uh, to, to certain people. And then we have to keep everybody just as long um, uh, kept in the, uh, the, uh, the police office. And we draw the line beyond this. Now we would say, well, let's analyze the performance of this AI model. Wait a minute, there's way too much bias to ethnicity. We don't want that. And that, that's a change. That's a moral change. And so let's look at this from, from the, the business perspective now. What, what do you think or what have you seen, uh, if you have seen things that you can share, where organizations are doing things that might be regrettable either now with, with the AI acts and, and regulations coming out or in the future as, as we realize what, what might come. Yeah, absolutely. So when we look, uh, when we assess systems, we look really close and we want to know what you're doing there, what you're doing there. And then we find certain, uh, decisions often done by, uh, made by engineers, with no uh, bad intent, but with large consequences. Like, for example, uh, a video recognition system that uh, is supposed to use blurred images, but uh, for some part of the task uh, isn't working uh, well with those blurred images. So they decide, well, let's unblur the images. Uh, let's, let's use the original images because it performs better. Um, and by doing so, uh, violating you know that intent of uh, uh, anonymizing the uh, video material, 
Uh, it's so easy to do because data scientists, AI engineers are so much focused on creating a working model. And if the model doesn't work, then there's no business advantage. Uh, so yeah, you see some sacrifice um, on purpose sometimes, uh, but mostly um, uh, without bad intent of, uh, of responsibility uh, with, uh, with AI just to get these, these working models. So it's, it's good to keep an eye on it, use, using uh, testing frameworks, uh, doing self-assessment, or letting somebody else have a, have a close look before it turns into a trial and before it turns into a liability issue and uh, loss, loss of business or uh, maybe yeah, complete going bankrupt as a, as a company. And of course, you, you mentioned the, uh, use the video example. Um, this can be audio, it can be video, it could be biometrics, fingerprints, eye scans, voice scans, uh, clearly other types of data as well. Is, is the issue, I think I know the answer, but is the issue related to any one of those or does it become even bigger when you start to combine them? Um, uh, how does, uh, does, do we get to a point where you just shouldn't do that anyway because there will almost likely be a scenario that you'll regret later? If you can, cause like the old, the old privacy conversation, if you don't collect the data in the first place, you don't have to secure it and you don't risk losing it or exposing it. And therefore you're, you're better yeah. off. So again, there's, that, there's, there's, a, there's a good analogy with, with privacy indeed. And also, um, if you look at the European privacy regulation, it's, it, um, it says a lot about, for example, the purpose that you apply, that you uh, use the data for needs to be the purpose that you collected it for that prevents a lot of the AI uh, uh, purposes already. Um, so understanding those uh, and applying those uh, not just from the, you know, the privacy officer uh, point of view, but also from the engineers is important. And it's not that difficult to make engineers more aware of, 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 of privacy aspects and of AI aspects. I always say to engineering teams that you need to treat personal data like it's radioactive gold, so it's valuable, uh, but you don't want to, you know, have it, you know, hanging around. You want to know where it is. You don't want to keep it too long. You want to minimize it because um, for a system uh, to reduce risk, um, especially in a zero trust environment, someday something is going to happen. And then you want to have as, as little data as possible uh, in place. This is a question that I've, it's been in my mind and funny enough, I've not asked it yet on any, in any conversation, which is there are ethics, morals, laws, standards, we can all follow. And those are, those are there for, for whom want to abide by them, right? And then, and then there's the nefarious crew, which can tap into public data, um, stolen data that maybe not folks aren't aware that it's been exposed yet and use it maybe not for the most complete, perfect, business case, business model tried and tested by an engineer, right? But working well enough to conduct some activity that, that isn't lawful or could cause harm to somebody. So how, what are your thoughts on how we tackle that? If, uh, hopefully you have, have some ideas there. There is very little record of it, uh, huh. apart from the obviously uh, malicious applications of AI for uh, for example, creating phishing emails. Uh, but other than that, um, there's very little, there's, there's neglect, definitely, but malintent, we see that, we see that very little. Yeah. And yeah, I guess I, I always think a little, a little, uh, cautiously about some of these things and perhaps slightly pessimistically, uh, just looking for those holes. Um, but always, I want to circle back now, kind of with with the aim to understand 
that risk so we can then mitigate it. So I want to go back to some of the work you've been doing and, and look at this, look at that work in the context of how an organization would approach uh, applying some of the, some of the models and the frameworks and the tools that, that have been developed and the knowledge that, that exists like in the AI exchange, who, who, who leads that charge? Is that, uh, is it engineering? Is it security? Um, is it a risk team? Who, who's responsible for, in the context of AI, kind of grabbing a hold of all that stuff and saying, here's how we navigate this? Yeah, multiple, multiple roles are involved. Um, one role is, let's call it the governance, risk, and compliance role. Uh, what the AI exchange refers to as having an AI program, uh, meaning that you need to be aware of where you are applying machine learning algorithms in your organization, for what purpose, with what data, and what the risk what the risk category is and what the risks are, just to be able to act upon those and maybe to decide, well, maybe we should not go ahead with this uh, this initiative. That's the governance risk compliance. The other angle, uh, closely related, is the security angle. Let's say the security uh, officer. There are a number of things that uh, this role needs to be aware of when it comes to AI. There are new assets, there are new types of risks, supply chain risks, uh, all kinds of particularities for AI that uh, the uh, the CISO needs to be aware of. And they're, they're documented in the AI exchange and in, in many other uh, publications. Interesting is that um, half of the controls against uh, machine learning attacks are data science controls, which means that these are things that data scientists need to do. Uh, normally, um, uh, CISOs are working with uh, security professionals and application security specialists and network security specialists. Now, they also need to work with data scientists that need to build um, pattern detections against certain attacks that need to add more noise to the training data in order to prevent certain attacks taking place. Uh, so it becomes much more multidisciplinary. And the same goes for the third role, which is the development manager or the, uh, the chief information officer that has a practice in software. And what we often see in organizations is that uh, the um, AI engineering is taking part in uh, virtually a different place, a different room uh, where apparently different rules apply. Mostly the rule is uh, get me a working model uh, I don't care how you do it. We want the working model. And that's because um, AI engineering is new to organizations. And it's also because data scientists have been educated that way and are driven that way. And yes, they are also often managed that way. Get me a working model. But then the model works and needs to go into production and maybe needs to be transferred to another team. Then often it turns out that it's quite hard to change uh, because it has been put together in sort of a lab mode. It needs to work, so let's copy and paste some code and let's not worry too much about maintainability or testing. It needs to work. The problem is if it needs to go in production and provide really provide that business value, it's actually too late because a new team can't understand what you've been doing, doesn't know about your experiments, all the things that you tried and that failed because you didn't document them. Um, now, this sounds like really uh, sort of a, uh, me uh, bashing a data scientist. Not at all. These are, I mean, as, uh, valued uh, assets to organizations and, and, and increasingly rare and very important and essential to have. And what they require in practice is guidance when it comes to uh, creating future-proof software that is transferable to other teams. It slows them down, it will slow them down, definitely, because they will need to document their experiments, but it's for a good cause. And uh, some things may seem like slowing down, but maintainable code that I write in the morning will help them 
uh, in the afternoon. And this is also what we see with data science teams that we work with. Uh, when you show them how they can do abstractions, how they can create unit uh, 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 unit testing, um, how they can set up a, a good architecture, they embrace it. But often this is missing from their education, and this will be uh, this is an attention point for 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 AI education, uh, making it more of a software education. And what organizations also can do is combining a data scientist with software engineers in teams, and of course measuring. Uh, the test code, measuring the maintainability, creating that feedback loop and coaching these data scientists in creating uh, better systems because this is a this is a big worry. And if you look at these three roles, uh, they they all three suffer from AI often being overlooked and, and treated in in uh, in isolation, whereas it just should be included in the standard security practice, in the standard software development best practice, and in the, the compliance practice. And the AI exchange discusses how to do this for, for security, and the 5338 standard discusses how to do this for, um, for software engineering. And the new standard 42001, which is an AI governance standard, discusses how to do this for the governance risk and compliance role. That was a long answer, but uh, yeah. No, I love it. I love it. And um, uh, as we wrap here, uh, I want to throw you for another loop, but what you're describing uh, to me sounds a lot like a, a platform engineering module where there's a team building something that would be used by others within the organization, one or more applications, uh, feeding security programs, feeding policies, feeding, uh, yeah, governance risk compliance. How much in, in terms of looking at it from a security perspective, somebody presumably looks at it from a quality perspective as well. So are there any lines you can draw or parallels from quality assurance to security or perhaps a program, platform engineering perspective um, organizations that, that leverage that type of model. Uh, could you expand on what you refer to when you say platform engineering? Shared service where in, in, in essence, an organ, a, a part of the organization builds something that then is used uh, by another right. part of the organization. Yeah. Yes. So yes. component, component development or some, some platform elements, something along those lines. Yes, you don't see that a lot currently with uh, with with uh, with AI engineering. Of course, this this whole DevOps and platform en engineering idea is uh, is the future for for AI, and you, we see an increasing number of of, of products and, and frameworks uh, coming into place to uh, to make that happen. And just like with um, regular software engineering, you want to uh, embed and cover. As as much of the requirements as possible in those uh, in those frameworks, because there's so many things that you need to take into account. That in fact, the platform engineering is the answer to get all those covered. Uh, otherwise, it's just you, you just can't manage it. If you look at the AI exchange, uh, I think we're now at. Let me do an estimate. At 60, 60 controls that need to be in place for for AI security you don't want to bother engineers with having those controls in mind with everything that they do. You want to cover as many as possible in the, um, in the platform. Yeah. So platform engineering is the future for AI security and quality. Definitely including, uh, by the way, uh, taking care of, uh, other aspects than security, such as, uh, explainability, um, uh, and, uh, unwanted bias. You want to have those covered uh, as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, Rob, I, I think we could probably take any one of these points and any one of the uh, items that you mentioned and spend another hour on each one. <laughs> but uh, for, for today, we'll, we'll kind of wrap and I'll ask you to send, I know I have your post and uh, I have the AI exchange and the OWASP uh, one you mentioned earlier. I'll ask you to, to share the others with me as well so we can uh, 
make them available to everybody who's watching and listening here. Okay. And certainly happy to have you on again. And if, if folks want, want us to dig deeper into any particular area, just let me know. And, uh, Hopefully Rob will come back and join me and, and uh, maybe some of the others from the team that help some, put some of these things together. That'd be great. So thanks again, Rob. Any, any final words before we go? Thank you for the great questions. I loved it. Uh, I, and uh, uh, I, I like your relaxed style. So this was a pleasant, <laughs> pleasant conversation. Yeah. Thank you. I am relaxed. I am pessimistic and relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Nah, nah, it's very good. I appreciate uh, your time, Rob, and all the work you're doing. Uh, thanks for doing that for the community and, and society at large. And thanks, everybody, for listening and watching today. And share with your friends and your enemies. Subscribe. Stay tuned for more. I have a lot, uh, a lot already recorded and a lot uh, planned for the next few months. So hopefully you'll stick with me as we continue to redefine cybersecurity here on ITSB Magazine. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you learned something new and this story made you think, then share ITSP Magazine with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our columns. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.